All right. All right, you'll be ready. Okay, sounds good. All right, well, good morning, everyone. This is the Economic Development Committee. We will start with roll call. Yulby, can you take care of that for us? Roll call. Councilmember Moreno. Present. Present. Councilmember Morrell. Councilmember Harris. Present. Councilmember Green. Present. Councilmember Thomas. Present. We have a quorum. All right, thank you, you'll be. Uh, let me start with the approval of the minutes. Uh, if I can get a uh, motion to approve. So move, Green, or Harris is Okay, it's moved. been uh, moved by Councilmember uh, Harris, seconded by Councilmember Green. All in favor, if you can vote your machines. Oops. Thomas. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four yeas, no nays, <laughs> and, and the minutes are, are approved. All right, so that brings us to item number three, which is discussion of ordinance calendar 33867 concerning reducing public sector blight by building and maintaining a public facing inventory of city owned and movable property. I have a, a quick, we all love PowerPoints, right? <laughs> I have a quick uh, PowerPoint to, to go through just to, to explain um, the, the purpose of this ordinance. I think that for many of us uh, on the council, we certainly, I'll just make a few opening statements and then I'll tell you when to go. Um, we all get complaints about blighted properties throughout the city, but unfortunately, we also get complaints about vacant and blighted properties that are owned by the city of New Orleans. Is that, uh, and I say some, some of these properties that are, are vacant and that are blighted and, and that are not necessarily secure, uh, are slated to be developed into something in the future. But in the meantime, they remain in, in this state of deterioration and disarray, uh, at times with overgrown uh, lots and, and covered with, with graffiti. And as I mentioned uh, before, that some of these buildings are also uh, not secured where people can be going in and out. And, and with the buildings not being in, in decent condition, we don't want anyone um, getting injured. But more than anything, these properties are creating substantial quality of life issues for people who are living around these particular properties. So whether uh, it's in New Orleans East where they actually have an issue with many uh, city owned uh, lots that are significantly overgrown, including one next to the Livingston School, or whether it's uh, uptown and the heart of a residential area where a historic building sits uh, unsecured and deteriorating, or whether it's right on City Park Avenue where there's a building um, that once again, not secured and, and covered in graffiti. We as the city of New Orleans should not be breaking the law and, and having these buildings in this type of disrepair. So what we've heard constantly from residents is that they feel that these particular properties, and I agree with them, that they, they help to, the, to foster crime, they increase rodent activity. Uh, they even feel like these properties are diminishing their property values uh, because of the condition uh, that, that these particular lots and properties are in. And as I mentioned before, but most importantly, it's the quality of life that's being impacted in, in many of these neighborhoods by properties, once again, owned by the city of New Orleans. So that brings us to this particular ordinance, ordinance number uh, 33867. Sadie, you can go to the first slide. So the, the purpose of this ordinance is first to provide a, a cost projection to rehabilitate buildings to uh, what is going to be considered a fair condition. And I'll explain that in a little bit uh, so that the administration and the council so that we can work together to uh, figure out what, what, what funding is necessary to rehab these properties and particularly those that are in residential areas. The second part of it is that this will create a public online dashboard of these city unused properties so that the public and, and the council and potential developers will have online readily available, easy to access information on unused property owned by the city. I'm sure many of, of the council members, just like I do, uh, are, are questioned by, you know, whether it's, it's uh, uh, people in the community or whether it's developers or sometimes it's, uh, it's members of, of other governmental agencies asking, hey, do you all have any surplus properties? You know, what types of buildings are, are, are available? 
and and it's it's not easy to find that information. And so we're hoping that with this type of dashboard, it actually could help with moving along development even even quicker and gaining interest in some properties. So as we started working on this ordinance, first we had to take a look at what is what is the current law. If you can go to the next slide. So the current law is it is the responsibility to uh, maintain city owned property. And that is by the Department of Property Management. In the charter, it lists uh, section uh, 4, uh, 1401 uh, for the Department of Property Management, maintain all buildings owned or operated by the city for a public purpose and perform all custodial functions in connection uh, therewith. And then um, if we look at the code on the next slide, the law is also about securing uh, vacant property in section 26156, all vacant land, including undeveloped land and lots, plots or parcels of land containing vacant structures shall be maintained in a clean, safe, secure and sanitary condition as provided in this division as to not to adversely affect the public health or safety. And also in section 26444, uh, dealing with vacant structures and buildings to be kept secure to prevent ingress it shall be the responsibility of the owner and or agent of the owner of any vacant structure or building to maintain such vacant structure or building so secured and in such condition that ingress into the structure or building by unauthorized persons is prevented. So that is the current um, law. Fortunately, uh, what we have seen is that in, in, in our city uh, with some city owned properties, they are not being maintained or secured in violation of the law and as I mentioned before, um, this does create adverse quality of life, life issues for neighbors. It contributes to crime and impacts near, nearby real estate values as it increases rodent activity. And um, I think also important to mention, it continues the deterioration of the city owned property, which could in the future lessen its value as well. So as we work to address the problem and, and and, and, and talked with uh, folks with, with property management and also uh, with Mr. Threat with DPW, we, we looked at, you know, the problem we found kind of begins with, with the basics. So current law also says that property management is to complete a list of a, mo of a movable property and present to the council and uh, mayor by September 1 that list. Um, but it appears that that uh, master list though is, is very much lacking in detail and it's not being updated in a way uh, to be uh, relevant with what is happening now with the properties. And I can tell you that at, at least my office has not been receiving these updates on September 1 as to you know, what's happening with all of these um, particular properties or this list of properties. So what we determined needed to happen is first, there does need to be a thorough property review along with an assessment of rehab costs. So we have outlined in this ordinance some specific details that must be compiled and made available uh, to uh, the public and, and to the council. And some of it is, is pretty basic, of course, a municipal address of the address its present use and any former uses, the zoning designation, the date of acquisition, and the description of any buildings or other improvements located on the property, including the date on which they were constructed of known. And then the, the database also requires that the current condition of the property is listed. And that can be, and I'll go through the designations in a bit, but it goes from new, excellent, very good, good, fair, poor, or dilapidated. And it also um, requires that all properties with the property condition designations of poor or dilapidated shall include a cost estimate to return the property to fair condition and a construction timeline. So that's the piece that's so important. You know, these properties that are in, in poor or dilapidated condition, and as I mentioned, I'll go through that in a second, um, that, that what do we need to do to get those uh, to uh, 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 a posture where they're not covered in graffiti, where their lawns are cut, where they're secured, where people can't be going in and out, and 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 overall just in a better condition uh, for people who are living around these properties. So, 
properties uh, rehab to uh, improve standards. So the standard that we are uh, looking for, did I skip a slide, Sadie? No. Hang on, go to the, oh, sorry. So these are the descriptions of poor and dilapidated. So as you can see uh, up on the screen, so poor is badly worn, much repair needed, including possible structural repair. Many items need refinishing or overhauling, deferred maintenance is obvious, significantly overgrown grass and foliage, extensive graffiti, inadequate building utility and services, and then dilapidated, of course, that seems kind of obvious, but excessive deferred maintenance, abuse and or neglect, potentially in danger of collapse, approaching abandonment or major reconstruction, property that has fallen into a state of disrepair and deterioration through neglect or and, and or is structurally unsound requiring major repair. So for those two types of properties, if they're in those conditions, if for properties in those conditions, we want them upgraded to fair condition. And I'll explain what that means in the next slide. So fair condition. So, you know, because some of these properties may be slated for a project down the road, but we may be waiting for FEMA dollars or, or whatever it could be. So what will it take to bring these properties up to a, a fair condition? And when we're talking about fair, this doesn't mean it's going to be pristine, but it is going to be a, a, a building now brought up to the condition that now is, uh, you know, um, following the law and, and legal. So this, this means that sure, the, the property may still be in need of some repairs, but it's going to be structurally sound. It's going to be lacking of extensive graffiti. It's uh, going to be lacking of significantly overgrown grass and foliage, no major flaws such as extensive roof damage and or other major issues that would lead to additional deterioration of the property, uh, that the structure is secured to prevent unauthorized entry. So once again, you know, the, 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 I think some of the key pieces here is to prevent also future deterioration of, of, of the, the property. And one property that does uh, come to my mind, well, actually there's two, a couple of the properties that do come to my mind uh, are uh, buildings that overall, they seem to be in pretty good uh, uh, structural shape, but the windows are all broken on top. Hey, the windows are all broken on top. It looks like they may have some roof damage. So as weather comes in, uh, these buildings are just going to further and further and further deteriorate if these, these types of common repairs are, are not made to these buildings. So the, the next slide. I think I must, okay. So um, we can go to the, that's fine. You can, go to the, you can go to the database. So the next piece, as I mentioned before, is for the database. Um, that once that there are these assessments made, uh, we can we can have something that is readily available to us. So when we get questions about specific properties, we can go straight online and check out, you know, what's going on with the property at, at City Park or what's happening with with uh, the the lots overgrown lots over on um, on Chef. What do the cost assessment looks look like to uh, fence off uh, those areas and when could work finally finally begin? So it creates additional oversight and transparency to create these databases. And of course, you know, once again, um, I think it would be uh, very beneficial to those interested in potentially uh, developing, uh, whether it's housing or businesses throughout the city of New Orleans to be able to take a look at uh, available properties that the city may have that maybe one day will go to auction or potentially go through the, through the NORA process. And so finally, what we're hoping with this particular ordinance is to promote transparency, planning and collaboration, hoping that this does lead to rehab property. And as I mentioned before, uh, the reason why this is an economic development is we're hoping too that this increases development interest due to increased access to information and, uh, and that properties would be in improved condition as well. So that's what this ordinance does. I'm happy to take any questions um, from the dais. If not, Mo, if you want to come up, I know you've got some things that you've been um, planning as well and take some, some questions. Oh, you can come to the table, Mo, if you want. And introduce yourself too, because I know you haven't been on, on the job for too long. <laughs> Hey, 
Good morning, council members. Good morning. Uh, my name is Natesh Mohan. Uh, I go by Mo, so much easier. I'm the new director of property management. I've been in city government or any government for that matter for a whole uh, three months. Uh, prior to that, of course, uh, private enterprise uh, all over the world working for banks uh, and such in facilities and real estate management. Okay. Uh, I want to say a few words. First of all, this is a very worthy um, ordinance and cause. Uh, it has recently come to my attention that there was this ordinance on the books and several properties have come to my attention as well as requiring work, whether their condition, their condition is considered fair or dilapidated, et cetera. But one of the things I want to emphasize is this. Um, I want to make two or three points. The first point is if the ordinance uh, could exclude the buildings that we use all the time, and there's a reason for me to say that, meaning city hall or the courts or the, the police departments and the fire department buildings, et cetera, those are occupied and managed, and that's part of our management routine. We take care of those buildings. We do everything we need to, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I would suggest that, and the reason I suggest that I would leave them out is because it takes an enormous amount of resources to do the inspections and get adequate condition assessments and then get fairly uh, uh, accurate assessments on what it costs to rehabilitate uh, the, the uh, properties. So first, let's say, Let's say this ordinance is really aimed at blighted properties, vacant properties, et cetera, as, as you've described. So that's the first suggestion, is that just let's limit ourselves to that discussion. Second, we do need resources. We don't have inspectors in our department. Uh, we, are, we are stretched thin as it is, just managing the buildings we have. But given that this is a worthy cause, I'd like to make a case for resources, which means inspectors to go out who are qualified, who can judge the quality of the roof, the quality of the walls, the windows, et cetera, and, and give us a fair assessment of what needs to be done to secure the properties. And as, as, as you all know, council members, you can secure a property in February and have it unsecured in March. We have properties that we're boarding up all the time and we get complaints two weeks later that somebody has gone into the building you know, taking out copper and whatever else they, they get into the buildings. So it's, it's a slippery slope, but we will, we will do it. Given some resources, we can attack the blighted buildings. Last point I'd like to make is this. There are so, I'll give you an example. Uh, Councilmember Marino, you asked me to look into a property on, on Loyola Avenue, which I did on Friday. And yes, it's in awful condition. It is completely dilapidated. It is in danger of hurting somebody if anybody goes in there and we need to do something about it. And we will. It so happens, <clears throat> it so happens that it's also under consideration for disposition of some kind. And there are some complications related to that disposition, but we should, and I've already recommended to the committee that's looking into this, that this particular property be looked at very quickly. And by the way, we're going back there to secure it because it's not secure at the moment. Uh, there's also a greenhouse on the property that is in terrible shape that could hurt somebody if they accidentally went in there. So yes, we know that that property needs to be secured. On the other hand, there's another property, for example, the second district police station. Uh, I went in there about a month ago. It looked okay. I went in there with our deputy, uh, 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 Rico, and uh, it, it looked okay. And then about two weeks later, there was a film uh, filming at the uh, building. And when they went in, they discovered they, the piece of the flooring gave way, a piece of the roof had, had collapsed and water had entered the premises. So there's a property that's sort of in fair condition, but it's still not gonna be used by the city. The police department is not gonna be in there. That is another property that is dying for quick boarding up and quick disposition. So uh, let, me, let me just uh, 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 summarize. Yes, we would like to concentrate just on the blighted and vacant lands, et cetera. 
we need resources to do so. Uh, if you exclude all the properties that we live in all the time, again, city hall, courts, uh, fire departments, police departments, that's okay because we manage those buildings anyway. That's not where the problem is. The problem is in the unoccupied uh, properties and the vacant properties. We do some need some resources to do that. Uh, and absolutely, uh, we are looking, because we've, we haven't really done this work, you're absolutely right. The ordinance was already on the books and required a, a report by September. Uh, if it's only blighted, we can certainly deliver by next September, uh, but we wanna get some resources to go out and start uh, 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 examining these properties and giving us an assessment. So for example, there'd be, there'd be no sense to give you an assessment of the 5,600 Loyola and say, it's gonna cost, oh, I don't know, somewhere between eight and $10 million to, to rehab this building. Well, that's not what we wanna do with that building. There are other ways you can, the city can gain advantage of that property. There are, again, there are some legal complications, but that's up to law to give us some advice. Yep. So yes, we wanna do this. So I'll say a couple of things. One, so as you mentioned before, I mean, it's already current law that um, you're supposed to compile and maintain a database of each parcel and immovable property owned by the city, including vacant land. Now, I'm fine with saying that if you want to do the assessment um, for, you know, where you rank them new, excellent, very good, good, fair, dilapidated for, um, if you, for that very specific assessment, um, which would be the new part of the, of the law, um, I'm happy to make that, you know, just for the unused properties yeah. as part of the database. So that's fine. Um, but then the other piece too that you mentioned, you know, you're talking about the Gumbel building that you were talking about on Loyola, uh, that it would take eight to $10 million to rehab. That's to do the whole new development. What we're talking about putting a, a building to, you know, fair condition is, you know, make sure that the, that the windows are, you know, boarded up that, you know, that you can't gain access into the building, which means you're going to have to fence it off. Uh, make sure that as I'm just reading parts of the ordinance, you know, obviously not significantly overgrown, um, grasses, which is exactly what's what's there. You can't even see across the way because the grasses are much taller than I am. Um, and so it's really about getting the, con the properties to the condition where they're not going to fall into more disrepair and they're not going to significantly yeah. impact the quality of life of, of people around it. I, I mean, that's a property. It's a beautiful building that's wide open yeah. and the impacts of the weather are killing it. It and is. and that is a building where I think that that could be you know potentially fantastic for for housing um, or whatever else you know but it's right in right across from a school right in the middle of a residential area um, and so that that's really what what it means and I can't imagine that that's going to cost eight to no. ten million dollars no I I meant it, if it were to be completely put back in shape right. and, and 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 used again uh, et cetera. but let me specifically say about that property. Um, there, there, there is an organization that has a CEA on the adjoining property, and they are taking care of the lawn and the and the bushes in the this property itself. But in, incidentally, I, I actually looked at the high grass on one side, and I said, "What happened there?" And they said, "Oh, that was a community garden, and we have nothing to do with the community garden, and that was left to go." So, so what we will do? What we will do? Having visited that site, we will, of course go back and reboard up everything that we can reboard up. And we'll probably get our friends at, uh, at Parks and Parkways to come in and take that tall grass down because the other, the other organization doesn't think it's their responsibility because that was a community garden, not part of their organization. So we will, so yes, the answer is on that property, we are gonna board it up. Uh, uh, but again, cautionary, we can board it up tomorrow and next week there could be somebody going through the property again and, and sort of uh, vagrants do get in regardless of how much boarding you do. Yeah, yeah. But we, we can try, we absolutely do it. Yeah, absolutely and, and, do. and that's really what the law says. That yes, we absolutely, yeah. we can do that. Um, and I think the, the other uh, piece too is, you know, when you and I were speaking, you handed me a database of roughly 50 to 60 properties that are currently inactive as they're being called, uh, owned by the city of New Orleans. And, you know, that's not, that's, that's a lot of properties, but not a lot of properties. And so I think that to be able to go and do the assessment of these 50 to 60, particularly since some of the properties on this list even say that they have been sold, so they're not even ours, um, I think wouldn't be such a, a heavy lift. But once again, 
um, we're here to help you with the resources. And, and you know, we, we've been having discussions with the CAO about best utilization of our ARPA dollars. I certainly think it would be a great one-time investment to, to buy additional equipment like big grass mowers and things like that to be able to uh, more easily clear lands. Like Joe Thread has talked about, you know, the lack of, of that type of equipment to deal with uh, clearing lots. And that's certainly the problem that we do see in uh, New Orleans East. There are properties along Chef. Um, there's a property right next to the Livingston School, you know, not fenced off. Yeah. Very, very high grasses. Um, you know, the ones off of Chef, it's, it's, it's such a densely wooded area now, but it's like, you know, people are just throwing their trash in there. I mean, if we could fence that off even, but we're, we're here, what, what this ordinance wants to do is add the, to the collaboration. Let us help you with what is necessary to get these properties back into, uh, into uh, following the, the, the requirements of the law um, and getting them to what, what we're calling that fair condition. I, I, I agree with you. And by the way, uh, when, it, when it involves tall grass, when it involves sanitation issues, we do call upon our friends at Sanitation and Parks and Parkways, and they're very responsive to us as well. So that'll be part of our, uh, um, that is, that'll be part of our MO uh, going forward on those kinds of properties. But you're right, we need it, first we need to, to refresh that database. And you've, you've done us a great service by changing the scope just to for blighted and unused properties, because that, that leaves us all the used properties, which about, we have 400 and change properties. That's a separate issue completely. And that's not the purpose of this ordinance. So that changes our way of thinking about what resources we need. So thank you for that. Uh, so I think we, we're, we're on the right path. Council Member Thomas, followed by Green. Is the city exempt from uh, code enforcement? Sorry, sir? Is the city exempt from code enforcement uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of property laws? Uh, would you like to take that call? Uh, I don't want to answer a code because enforcement the, question. There the, are the laws that govern by- Mr. Mulligan's here. I'm sure he can answer the question. The laws that govern private property that have been on the books since the first city charter. Is, is the city exempt from maintaining an upkeep the way everyday citizens are? Uh, I, I want to talk to the lawyers to be certain. I don't believe so, though. I can't recall any provision- uh, That says no. In the code, yeah. yeah this is an age old question here. So, so the, the effort is, how did you guys categor, categorize your property? Uh, imminent danger, uh, uh, their impact on adjacent buildings or businesses or residents versus simple boarding and simple grass cutting and maintenance. What system do you use? Would you repeat that question? I'm not quite sure I got the question right. From blighted to imminent danger to neighborhood impact. How does this particular city property impact uh, a, a residence, a business, or an adjacent community? What's your evaluation process? It it well in terms of how immediate. We we we, we don't have that evaluation process right now. What we need to bingo. do bingo bingo right. So we, we don't have it now. We want to get the solution. We need we need we need to we need we'll to come up with a methodology of saying solution. Look at the look at the look at the two buildings we just talked about. Right. How does it how does it how does it affect the community? The way F fifty six hundred Loyola affects the community is different than the way the, the second district police station affects the community. Correct. This so we have to react differently to this each. This is a new and it's not rocket science, right? Right. And I don't know where it got lost, but one of the good things that the uh, I think the Memorial administration and, and uh, even. Partly the policy after that was they use an evaluation process from public works to evaluating the impact. This thing called neighborhood impact, a community impact. So how soon can we come up with that evaluation process, a system to present to the council, to present to council member Moreno? Um, I think we could, we originally was, were scheduling around April to give you a full assessment of all the blighted properties. Okay. And, and, and we can include that in terms of a radius. Yes. Right, in terms of rate. Yes, if it's, if it's just a blighted and vacant properties, et cetera. We know, we know, I may have not said the right words, but we know what we mean. Uh, we can probably do it by April. Uh, we, we get some solution number one. Two, the cities that are successful, they're not trying to maintain their disposable or potentially dispensable property. 
the agencies at work, it, whether you like our school system or not, or the housing authority, the, the, the one thing that they've kind of been good at is disposing of property on the roads that they don't need so that it could be put back into commerce. And let me tell you why, right? So you gotta, gotta kind of research this stuff. What, I'll never forget there was a property uh, under the Negan administration that they spent so much money boarding it up, fencing it up and cutting the grass. It actually was worth more than the property. As money could have went to North, could have went to the police department, could have went other places. So on the surface, you want to do that, right? You want to make sure that, especially if it's safe right, and it's blighted. But the last thing you want to do is invest in it so much that it impacts other agencies and, and potential for, 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 for other, uh, other programs receiving funds. So what program do we have or what's the process for dispensing or disposing of property and how we rate them? Do, do we have a system for that? The only program that I know of, again, uh, three months in city government, I have come across the work, some, something called a working group. And a working group is made up of many different departments. Okay. And they get a list of properties. I believe there are about 20 properties at the moment that they're looking to do something with. Okay, good. So now we're gonna to come to the solution number two. We can start from neighborhood impact again, right? And evaluating and rating the projects, right. right? From blighted to uh, hazard to health hazard, right? So then solution number two would be, what is the property land use? How do we target that property? How do we attach some incentives, right? Or some value to it so that it's marketable? So that we don't keep it on our roads to continue to put public dollars in the fencing and boarding and cutting but maybe we could, we, could, we could attach some incentives to that public property so that people could say, okay, wow, it makes sense. The, 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 the city government, this solution number two, y'all got this, right? So this is solution number two. Let's target that property, figure out what its highest and best use is. How can we incentivize it so someone could maybe take it off our roads? Because keeping it on our roads is costly, right? Now, I don't mind helping you guys with that. We did that uh, in the Lower Garden District in the Central City several years ago with the Renaissance Plan in Central City working with ACT and other community groups. Let's identify those properties, right? And how do we begin to, uh, to shape them with zoning or land use so that they're attractive to investors? That's, yeah. That's, that's, and one thing I'll mention, Council Member Thomas, is that uh, for our most prominent public properties like NSA, economic development, uh, Office of Economic Development is deeply involved in those discussions. They have that body of knowledge. They understand how to go after those tax incentives. So I do think that's an Bingo. opportunity uh, for us to work closely together and also hear from you uh, on the council about the properties that are most important to you. And, and bingo, lastly, you know, one of the conservative sides of me, right, is that Government always wants to know what it can get first instead of what we can create in terms of opportunity for community and then get ours because we've created something. Let's start disposing of this property. You know, you know, you know and I'm not necessarily saying give it away. And this is not nothing okay. new. Other communities do this. And yet one of the reasons why I always just go to those National League of Cities conferences and legislative conferences wasn't just to travel. It was to learn from others, it's not new out here under the sun, but how do we dispose of property, give it away, or maybe legislate it away so that it can create some scales of economy, put it back into commerce, and we could phase in how we benefit from it at some point. And that is something that I wish we did. Too often, we want to know what we can get on the front end when it's not producing anything on any end. I agree with you, uh, uh, Councilmember Thomas. Uh, in fact, in fact, I want to just say during my interview with the mayor for this job, she said, and what are you going to do about the second district police station? Uh -huh. I said, what is the second district that's, police that's station? A pretty, that, that's a pretty good area. Uh, that's yes, a pretty good it's area. a wonderful area and it's, it's an a wonderful piece area. of property. And so I assure you that uh, it, is, it, is, it is in all of our interests to one, look at the piece of property, assess its value, future value to the city, and if, and if there is no future value to the city, 
then bring in the people at economic development, et cetera, and the working group and say, here's a piece of property, let's do something with it. Okay. I believe that's the way to go. All right, so that's three, three potential solutions that kind of make, and look, I'm not, no, you know, I learned this from reading what other communities do. And that's important. I mean, you know, we don't have to keep reinventing the wheel, right? The laws on the books, other communities yeah. that have been successful. So let's put the, let's amend that working group that you have. That maybe includes some 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 legislators. You know, this the legislative branch of government. I don't like doing administrative stuff, right? Legislative, and to see if we can maybe take advantage of some of the, that stuff that happens around the country and in other places that's working. But and I will say this. This is noble, but the solution isn't to keep it on our roads and keep using taxpayers' dollars to keep yeah. boarding and cutting and fencing. And guess what? You multiply some of those boards and fences and grass, especially when you start fencing property, you know how much that costs every time the yes, fence sir. is torn down and put together. You know, that's one of the reasons why we're doing a new sound wall in New Orleans East. And first of all, to thank the governor for having a relationship with him. They've been fighting for that for decades, but putting the fences back up, putting the fences back up. Man, that is more costly than investing on the front end. And we are not good here at investing on the front end so we can have long-term results. So three I, things. I, I, will suggest, I will suggest that we include a, a timeline for a decision on what needs to be done with this property. I think Council Member Marino expects that. I think this is a, a noble discussion, but there are solutions out there where other communities and other municipalities have taken advantage of this before. You know, we, we need to get this property off our Got roads. It. We don't need to keep maintaining it because that costs money that you can put that in some kids programs or some old folks or some community programs. All right, let's we agree. that. We agree. Appreciate you, man. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, Council Member <laughs> Green and then <laughs> Council Member Harris. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation and congratulations on your new position. Looking forward to working with thank you. Thank you, sir. I wanna start off with a positive by um, thanking and acknowledging code enforcement um, because in my district, um, I'm pleased to say that somehow or the other, the incredible number of almost one house a week has been demolished. And I know what it takes to demolish a house. Um, it's not just the legal parameters, but it's also the physical parameters, blocking off areas to get into and hauling away the trash. So um, I'm just pleased with that. On that end, I will tell you that at the same time I see those demolitions taking place, it's always dawned on me, of course, because of my experience over the years that the city has properties that we should demolish ourselves that we own. Councilman Thomas can certainly take care of his area and he does a fine job. But when I was the head of the New Orleans Regional Business Park in New Orleans East, one of the biggest blights in that area was a city owned property at the corner of Reed and Old Gentilly Road, that former transfer station. It's never gonna be redeveloped into a property. As part of this discussion, rehabilitation, bringing it back to fair and good property, I mean, good condition. I hope that we will look at demolition and the benefits that it will offer to just simply get rid of some of those properties that we have that reasonably aren't gonna be back in commerce soon. Um, some of the properties that have been demolished in my district, the Motlison, for example, um, St. Bernard Avenue, that former commercial structure and others have facilitated and motivated investment by people who own land next to them. I think that could be the same case if we got rid of some of the blight that we as a city own. Redevelopment is fine, but redevelopment is not always gonna be reasonable. Correct. It's definitely not reasonable at Old Gentility Road and Reed. For example, I have a issue right now with a property at 2632 Desire. It's at the corner of Desire in Florida where we're putting, I know you're familiar with it because we brought it up and I'm gonna bring it up publicly. We're putting a lot of pressure on that owner because he parks vehicles illegally. He has fences that, well, he parks them in a way that violates city codes. I have to use the language correctly. And um, there's a lot of blight and dilapidation around it. But then right across the street is a city owned property that form a healthcare building that um, is at the corner of Desire and, Flor and um, Florida, which if that were removed, it would be easy for me to feel that we could put more pressure on him. 
And it really is not going to be probably a health clinic anymore, especially since the city is building a multi-purpose center at the corner of Johnny Jackson Jr. in Florida. So it's a candidate, in my opinion, for demolition and potentially making the land available for some other use. The good thing about the city owning property that um, it's done some work on is that there are no liens on the property. I mean, we don't put liens on our own property. So it's just as easy to declare it in imminent danger of collapse or a health hazard and to demolish it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to see us look at that more amongst the list of properties that we have recognize that there have been changes in certain areas, um, industrial changes, for example, residential changes that are going to make certain properties not candidates for development, even if we made them available at a dollar to somebody else. Let's look as we look at this ordinance at the issue of demolition. Thank you. More closely. Another thing that I want to mention is just a, philosoph a philosophical thing. Even though this ordinance looks at and con contemplates vacant properties, we do have to be concerned whenever we suggest that the city be held to a lower standard in some respects than we hold the average resident. We have to, in our buildings that are occupied, whether it be our fire stations, whether it be our health buildings, our health department buildings, whether it be our police stations, whether it be our city hall, we have to be conscious that every week we collect money from people who we find because they haven't taken care of their grass they haven't taken care of their buildings. Their overhang is a violation of city codes. But if we have the same thing going on with multiple buildings ourselves, we have to, recon we have to reconcile ourselves with the fact that that's not fair and that people use that in terms of criticism of government. So the bottom line is that if it's something that needs to be done in one of our buildings, we need to get it done. You need to let us know. I know that there are concerns relative to contractors and inspectors, and I always encourage people to try to work for city government because the jobs are great. But what the one thing that we can't say is that the city is going to be held to a lower standard than the people that we find all the time. So demolition and holding ourselves to the same standard that we hold the average citizen to are two very important concerns. But I look forward to working with you with this ordinance that I know is going to have a positive effect but also in holding us to the same accountability standards that we hold others to. I agree, thank you. Council Member Harris. Thank you, um, Mo and Thomas. We've had a good relationship so far and I, I wanna keep that out. I do wanna uh, make some comments about um, what we've been doing in the district, which is walking properties with code enforcement, taking note of blighted properties and overgrown lots, um, illegal dumping. We do it every Friday in various neighborhoods. Um, so you're talking about getting additional personnel. When I'm out there with the code enforcement folks, they are identifying properties that are city owned. So I'm wondering if you couldn't cross train your additional personnel with code enforcement because they already have in their mind and in their system, what is city owned property? Um, that is overgrown because we saw a Nora own lot that was overgrown. We saw a Hanno overgrown lot, which I understand is not city property, but it's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, so I'm wondering just as a technical matter, when you get this additional personnel, whether or not it would make sense to cross train with code enforcement since they're out all the time and they're the ones who get the reports. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. Uh, yes, uh, we, ha we haven't talked about that. Uh, certainly Mr. Mulligan's here and we can open that discussion uh, about how we can work together. Uh, so yes, thank you. Um, so maybe it'll, 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 it'll help us with the resources, but it'll, be, it'll help us with eyes and ears on the issue as people are going through. And while, while uh, Council Member Green was speaking, I was thinking perhaps we open a dialogue with each district after we get our yep. list, of, list of properties, We'll sit down with each district uh, 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 people to make sure that, hey, how about this one or how about that one? You'll give us more uh, data on other properties that you may know of, et cetera. So uh, we'll, we'll have as, as, as good a list as possible. Yeah, you read my mind on that because I, I literally say list of properties via district. So I think that would be important. Go. The other thing I think is important is in this working group, understanding the feedback from community groups who might be interested in the property. So when this comes up and there is a property that the city owns and the working group is trying to figure out how to dispose of it, really getting some community feedback and understanding the community needs. I know Mo, you and I had worked on the Keller Center and trying to get that back open. And we need to 
understand the community, what groups have used it in the past, what groups want to use it in the future. And I think the same thing can be said for city owned property that's blighted or, or might be disposed. Right. So I think community input, and I think you and I agree on that. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a great step in, in, in that direction. I, I think that'll work. The final technical thing that I have, and lawyers should never say final, but on um, asset management tools, uh, Joe Threat last week, I think that was last week, uh, sat in here and said that they are now exploring asset management tools. And uh, again, this is just a technical thing because I think technically, I'm wondering if you couldn't use that tool to uh, database, use that to create a database of these city owned properties. So I don't want, again, it's just more efficiencies in government, which we're all trying to get to. Um, and so cross training code enforcement, using a tool that's existent or will be in existence soon um, so that we're cutting down on costs, cutting down on personnel, but increasing the impact. What you don't wanna have is code enforcement looking at a property once, then your team looking at the property again, and then disagreeing on what should be done with it. So again, I just wanna emphasize um, those inefficiencies and, and minimizing those inefficiencies because as we all know government can be super inefficient yeah um thank you i i do want to make a comment yes the asset management tool is currently in progress the rfp is in progress however the uh, the the overall goals of the asset management tool is to look at all properties 500 plus properties and it does things like it it talks about the age of the walls the age of the roof age of but that's not what our interest is in this ordinance. Or yes, we can use it for the blighted properties, but its purpose is so much bigger and the scope is too big. We can, we can zero in on blighted and vacant properties, et cetera, uh, and, and with, with a view towards, what do we do with these 50, 60, 70 properties? Work with the council, work with the working group, and come to, as I said, have a, have a timeline on what you should do with each of these properties. Dispose of it, demolish it, sell it, et cetera, and come to those conclusions fairly quickly. Yeah, I, I, I guess to my point is, um, Mel, I just don't, we've experienced so much cross-talking with code enforcement, with Department of Sanitation on getting lots cleaned up where people are working in silos and trying to unsilo that work so that code enforcement is working with sanitation. I know you do already, but making sure that whatever database that you come up with is yes. shared so that again, we're just being the most efficient we can be um, as a city government, which is just generally inefficient, um, but making use of data um, systems and getting those systems in place that are shareable, even, even to the point where I think to council uh, president's point where our, my office can pinpoint a property and see what the status is and relay that to a constituent who might be interested. Um, I think that's all I have. Uh, and just thank you again for continuing to work on the Keller Center. I know we're gonna make some progress with that. We're almost there, but we, we need to resolve that. Yes, I know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mo. Uh, let me take public comment. Uh, Ms. Kim Ford, did she step away? Okay, I'll keep her card aside. Mr. Baptiste, Mr. Baptiste. Right, I'll keep him to the side. Um, Nathan Lott. Come on up, Mr. Lott. Good morning, council members. I'm Nathan Lott. I'm here on behalf of Preservation Resource Center 923 Chapatulis. Uh, council member Moreno, you and I emailed briefly about this ordinance. I just wanted to come down and thank you for introducing it. I think the spirit of this is um, very well taken and much needed You know, to bring a layer of transparency to what the city is doing in terms of stewarding its own properties, which are the public trust, which belong to all of us. I think that's very welcome. Um, and I think some of the properties we've talked about today do have great redevelopment potential. So two examples that I would hold up in fairly recent times so to give the administration due credit, the Turo Shakespeare home has now been put out to RFP. HRI is working on a redevelopment there to create affordable senior housing that involved a rezoning. Um, and it also brought to light that there was a deed restriction on the property. I believe the same is true of the Gumbel building on Loyola. I believe there's a deed restriction to use for people with special needs, disabilities, or possibly children. So that's a layer of information that in this data would be really helpful. Is there a specific use restriction on the property? Another great example is the firehouse on Loyola, I mean, sorry, um, on Louisiana, um, that's being redeveloped through the Nora redevelopment framework. You know, I think that's very promising, home by hand, and Olympic, um, a great track record. So optimistic about that project. 
that's one way to think about disposition, not necessarily putting things up for public auction, but routing them through this uh, method with Nora that allows for a, a public beneficial use. In fact, uh, OPSB is currently exploring doing something similar with its surplus property now, looking at that Nora model or other ways that they could you, you know, put schools out at, into the community for a beneficial use with a 99 year lease instead of just auctioning to the highest bidder. So keep that in mind um, as, as an option. And I think, um, yeah, the, the goal of getting these properties into use before they reach that point of being candidates for demolition. You know, when a, a property, particularly a historic property, reaches that point of imminent danger of collapse, that's just the, the demolition is the last in a litany of failures, right? So we wanna avoid getting things to that point if they do have a real reuse potential. So um, I'll just conclude by with one last little real practical note. Um, the age of the buildings and their potential eligibility for incentives is gonna be something that develop, developers are really interested in. So if something's 50 years or older in a state cultural district, it could probably benefit from state historic tax credits. You know, it might need to be added to the National Register to get a federal historic tax credit, but that can be done. Good developers do that. So, you know, thinking about the age of the buildings and what incentives might align with them could be useful. Thank you. Mr. Lott, you brought up some really good points because I, I don't think that often it's known that, as you had uh, mentioned, that it's in the charter about how public buildings need to be auctioned off until we recently did the new Nora redevelopment um, route. But but that really, you're right, has opened up new opportunities and, and created kind of uh, the best use um, for our, our public buildings as they go uh, back out for, for other purpose. And so I appreciate you bringing that up because I, I think that's still kind of a little known fact uh, uh, as to how properties are, are disposed of in New Orleans, either through the public bid process or through this Nora piece as well. So thank you for that. Yeah, glad to do it. I think there's been a reluctance on, on the part of some public agencies to sell public properties. And I think probably school boards felt this the most because people were alumni and they didn't want to see their school auctioned off, even though we have great schools housing redevelopment models. Um, but yeah, they, they, I think sometimes the reluctance to auction off a building when that was the only option has allowed it to sort of just sit and yep. older and that's not good. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lott. Alice Glenn. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Councilmember Moreno. Um, I a lot has been. I'm Alice Glenn. I'm here on behalf of myself as a property owner and a neighbor of 5700 Loyola, of which a lot has been said today. So I won't belabor. Um, but one point of clarification: that um, community garden that was referenced is not, in fact, a community garden. It was a sublet to a florist who was growing their own flowers on the property. Um, it was beautiful to look at for a period of time, but not um, did not have access to neighbors or the community. Um, be that as it may, we, um, you know, a lot has been said about the economic development potential and the other uses of these um, dilapidated properties. I, I certainly won't go into that. I think Councilmember Thomas in particular um, really highlighted some of the potential there. It's certainly um, historic preservation is an interest. It's quality of life for us, certainly as neighbors. Um, you know, we, I would say, have been acting as de facto property managers perhaps not coincidentally, uh, last week, the grass on that property was cut. Um, and, you know, these are, um, we are, we are getting responses when we reach out to various agencies with issues, problems, um, you know, many of those over the years since I've been there have been public safety related, right? And we've had to call EMS, we've had to call um, NOPD over the years multiple times. So when we think about certainly putting things back into commerce in an effective way that benefits the city, um, I think also, you know, getting rid of some of those real drains on other agencies and issues yeah. um, should be a real consideration. So really I applaud point. you for bringing this ordinance, anything that we can do to make the process more efficient, effective, um, and benefiting to the neighborhood and the city at large is welcome. Thanks really so good points. Thank you, Ms. Glenn. All right, uh, public comment, you'll be online. Thank you. We have one online comment on this item and the comment comes from Ursula Newell Davis. She's in support. If property is co-owned by the city, why can't those properties be sold to inter interested residents to bring it up to date and save the city money? I was interested in a blighted building at 3133 General Maya Avenue. I contacted the owner who doesn't want to sell, but has not paid taxes or fixed up the property in many years. This will force property owners to fix up their property or allow the city to sell it or repair them to prevent our neighborhoods from deteriorating. I'm trying to be the change in my community, hold someone accountable 
and it falls on the city. Thank you. Thank you, Yulby, and thank you, Ms. Ursula, for that public comment. All right, uh, well, that completes the presentation. Mo, thank you. I will keep working on this. We'll send you uh, the quick amendment on this particular ordinance, okay? Thank you very much. All right, with that, uh, I'm gonna make a motion to send it uh, to the full council and put it on the consent agenda. If I can get a unanimous vote, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor, aye. Aye. All right, it's unanimous, thank you. All right, that brings us to our uh, next presentation, item number four. It's Thrive New Orleans and Propeller to present on collaborative programmatic initiatives dealing with green infrastructure. Okay. If you all can uh, come on in, take a seat. And uh, when you are ready, you can introduce yourselves and begin the presentation. Okay. Um, good morning, hey, City good Council. Morning. Good morning, City Council. Um, we are so pleased to be here this morning. Um, and thank you, Council Members Green, Moreno, and Harris, uh, for taking the time to learn a little bit more about our work. My name is Andrea Chen. I'm the co founder and CEO of Propeller. And we are here today with our very close partner, uh, Thrive New Orleans, and we'll do a quick round of introductions before we begin. Sure, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you for your time. Um, Councilmember Harris, uh, Councilmember Moreno, and my good friend, Councilmember Green. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here to talk about an issue that's so important to our city, green infrastructure and stormwater management. And it's such a great, great, great opportunity uh, to partner with um, Propeller, a great organization. Again, Chuck Morse, Executive Director of Thrive New Orleans, and also the the president of the Hoffman Triangle Neighborhood Association. A little shout out to Sister Harris there. And also my church is in the Ninth Ward. Um, shout out to Brother Green there. Good to see you. Uh, well, good morning. My name is Adele London and I'm the Director of Community Development at uh, Propeller and uh, also a faithful member of Franklin Avenue Baptist Church since we Given a church shout out. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for having us. Good morning. I'm Bernadette Carrier. I am the director of Green Business with Thrive New Orleans. Thank you guys for having us. Good morning, Council members. My name is Damian Clark, and I'm the strategic project manager for Propeller. So we're excited to be here today, both of our groups, because economic inclusion is something that we are very, that are core part of our missions. And we know that this is a topic that's very important to the city council as well. So we would like to take the opportunity to talk about our programs and the challenges and the opportunities that we see specifically in the water industry and green infrastructure space. We see a lot of opportunities and we also see um, opportunities to partner with the city council and the city of New Orleans on some of these initiatives. So I'll begin with a brief introduction of Propeller. So our mission is to support and grow entrepreneurs to tackle social and environmental disparities. And our vision is for a thriving and inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystem that responds to community needs and creates the conditions for an equitable future. So we've been around since 2011 and we've accelerated over 300 ventures that have generated over 290 million in revenue and financing created hundreds of jobs. And we also, um, in terms of access to capital, we finance many of our own companies. Um, our social venture fund made $605,000 in loans um, and our borrowers are 100% BIPOC and 83.5% Black. 
And during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, Thrive and Propeller, we worked together with the Hope Credit Union to help over 200 small businesses apply for EIDL and PPP funding, um, resulting in over $4 million. Um, and many of these uh, loans were very, very small, under $10,000, which at the time, many um, financial institutions were not willing to work with these um, smaller businesses. And so we did the hands-on TA for that. And so we have a great track record. Our um, businesses and nonprofits have an overall survival rate of 84% compared to an average of 56%. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that Thrive New Orleans has been around since 2008. Uh, we have morphed a little bit and pivoted uh, where we focus uh, on sustainability and resiliency. We've also understand that for, for many BIPOC businesses, and underserved communities, they don't understand water management. Uh, they may understand water management, but they don't understand the economy of water management. So what we've done is that we have trained over 120 uh, small businesses, a um, majority are BIPOC businesses in green infrastructure and stormwater management. Uh, we are also a prime contractor uh, for the city uh, with the Gentilly CAP program, the community adaptation program, uh, where we have completed over 75 projects. Um, and because we completed those projects, we are also a prime contractor, but we are very intentional about subcontracting with BIPOC businesses uh, and also other businesses. Uh, but one of the things we also do is that we are the city's national disaster resilience operator, which means that we're tasked with training 175 individuals for the green infrastructure and stormwater management space. Uh, Sunei Velavaso is also in the audience today, and she's been a great partner with us in the workforce uh, development. Um, and one of the things I really wanted to, to let you know is that many of our people in our, in our workforce program are returning citizens. So as we think about how do we reduce recidivism, how do we make sure that people can come out, can leave prison and come back and find sustainable jobs, uh, we are training them for the future economy. And we, we train them with an earn and learn program. So we pay them a, a livable wage uh, for 40 hours a week for 12 weeks just to learn this trade. Um, and I know Sune is uh, trying to raise additional dollars for our Earn and Learn program. Uh, but this is a way for, we believe, this is an on-ramp for small businesses and an on-ramp for, uh, for the workforce as we move into the future. And as you know better than I, there's millions and millions of dollars to mitigate flooding in our city. We want to make sure our city, our whole city thrives uh, through this op these opportunities. So our um, so together um, we're working on a few shared objectives. The first one is to increase the overall receipts to BIPOC owned companies in the green infrastructure and water economy through public and private contracts. Okay, so in our, our second one is to increase some procurement opportunities for BIPOC companies in the green infrastructure space. We are looking to remove barriers. Where are the barriers to, to entry for our BIPOC businesses? So Andrea Thrive and Propeller, we're working together through the Advance in Cities program uh, with NOLA, NOLA BA. And we are, I'm on the leadership team and we're all working together as an organization, Thrive and Propeller to find out what are the challenges? How do we reduce bonding? How do we make, uh, debundle some of the contracts? What can we do to make sure that these contracts is accessible to all uh, within, within the, the realm of procurement for our city? Another big uh, component of this program is providing technical assistance, mentorship, and on-ramps to BIPOC-owned small businesses, whether it's helping people um, pre uh, prepare for bid opportunities, estimation, back office, to make sure that when people are bidding for a contract, they're ready. Um, they have what it takes. They've got all their documents together. They've got their line of credit. They've got um, access to capital. And also, when we think about the, the workforce and small business, uh, one of the things that we're doing is we're looking at barriers, of course, but we're also trying to defray cost. Because we're a prime contractor, we are we have purchased as a nonprofit organization uh, heavy equipment, bobcats, excavators, things like that. So they won't have to go to United Rental. Nothing against United Rentals, but they won't have to pay that fee. We will take care of that cost for them. We'll do the back of the office work also. We'll do the estimating for them too. And also one of the things that the, the pipeline um, between Thrive and Propeller, Thrive, Thrive we, have, we do a great job, I believe, and I guess I can say that, in helping them get on board, onboarding them, helping them learn that builds the acumen. Then we send them over to Propeller. 
through their, their wonderful accelerator program. And we walk with them for two years, even after they finish, to make sure that they can get traction. And then when, when, we get, when they get traction, they can then get momentum. Some of the opportunities coming up that we see. So on the city side, um, in Orleans Parish, Thrive and Propeller, we've worked together to identify in this year alone over $210 million in green infrastructure contract opportunities. And we would love for many of those opportunities to go towards local BIPOC owned companies. And that's something that we were very actively working towards. And we are asking the city council support in our efforts there. Another big opportunity is in the uh, statewide um, space. Um, and so one of our key um, agencies here is a Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, CPRA. You may have seen recent news articles about the mid Barataria project of over $2 billion that will be spent. So their 2023 annual budget calls for um, $1.3 billion in spending over 12 months. Um, and so again, that over $2 billion for several dozen levy, flood control, and other infrastructure projects. Some of that is gonna be led out through the Army Corps, DEQ, but a lot of it is coming out through CPRA. And so we know, current, well, the goal and opportunity is for these funds and these contracts to go towards locally owned BIPOC owned companies. Currently, there's very, very little tracking on that. And from our assessment, very little of it is going to Louisiana or New Orleans owned companies. But this is a $2 billion opportunity. And this is not something that we have, it's not gonna happen maybe in our, in our lifetimes again. And so we're asking also for your support to help us in terms of making sure that the subcontracting processes with the primes that are getting these contracts and just in terms of equitable procurement that, act, that actually moves forward, we don't have a lot of time left. Yes, and also just want to, I'm remiss for not thanking uh, you all for, uh, it's our understanding with Nora that you guys have, a, have used bond money to expand that program. That's gonna be a wonderful opportunity for many, many small businesses in the workforce to leverage those opportunities to really build their acumen and really get contracts. And they're smaller contracts, but they can grow and grow and grow. Again, we talk about the on-ramp uh, as it relates to uh, green infrastructure and stormwater management. Also, just want to mention also that the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice is also a partner. And also that um, I serve on the, the, the city's um, a master plan or environmental plan equity committee and where we are looking at to make sure that what our climate action plan is equitable. And as we um, make sure that we um, in include that in into our, our day to day work. And we must not forget that the private sector also has a role to play in terms of equitable procurement. And we have been engaging with many anchors in the private sector from Austria Health Systems, Xavier University, Tulane, um, in Mississippi, a couple of institutions like Tougaloo, Jackson State, um, CART Target Corporation. And so, um, working to, with these entities uh, to implement equitable procurement policies. And uh, many of these, anchors are doing green infrastructure projects and making sure that we can get um, our locally owned um, sure. BIPOC owned companies into the pipeline for those opportunities. Um, and you can see just some new news articles about the up, um, some of the um, contract opportunities coming up and projects. And we are working with the city's the Office of Resiliency to try our best to figure out how to remove barriers so that we can break down some of these contracts to make sure they're more inclusive. So some of the programming that we're running currently, um, and we thank council member Green for coming to the water challenge this year, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which we had at UNO, but this is a program that Propeller and Thrive have partnered with over the last few years. Um, it's a competition to, to really catalyze water innovation. And so it was presented by the Greater New Orleans Foundation. Um, it happened on June 1st, um, but this is really a part of a key investment into blue green infrastructure in New Orleans and providing pathways to contract and business growth opportunities for local small businesses. Yeah, I just want to also just share that we have a partnership with Parks and Parkways with Michael and his team, and that's been a great partnership. They've hired, I think, seven of our, our workforce people to work on their projects with Parks and Parkways. So it takes a village. And when I say it takes a village, uh, on our staff, uh, we have uh, uh, life coaches, we have behavioral health therapists, substance abuse counselors, uh, postgraduate postgraduate coaches and also job placement coaches all these people this is their village 
And every every day, whenever they go through any challenges, we want to meet those challenges head on and have professionals in place to deal with mental health, deal with the challenges that the workforce and small businesses may have as relates to moving their businesses, but also moving their families forward also. And especially when we talk about returning citizens being a large part of the programs that we do, we know what they face when they, when, when they uh, return home. And we try to figure out how to help them meet their felt needs, but also help meet their emotional uh, and, 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 and mental health needs also. So I'm going to talk a little bit about of how we get our businesses to those uh, contracts. And we get that through our, our Propeller Impact Accelerator. Uh, this is an interactive four-month program that helps startups bring their ideas from vision to reality and it help existing entrepreneurs sort of scale those businesses uh, so that they are access and capital ready for these projects. Uh, we have five focus areas when we do this. Uh, we have community economic development, uh, also the education space, early childhood education, uh, food, where we focus mostly on CPG, consumer packaged good uh, products, uh, water, and also health. Uh, and we do that uh, through the basic, uh, we provide direct business support to our businesses, that's through executive mentorships, and also our subject matter experts, where they are tailored in specific subjects as it relates to these five focus areas, and also a foundational curriculum. And that's everything from marketing to customer profiles. Uh, also, we have some raw health that help them get their incorporations. And, uh, also, uh, just managerial accounting for the businesses as well. Uh, also, we do access to capital, uh, and that's on the nonprofit and profit side. And most of that is just uh, filling out these businesses, seeing what they need as far as funding for their businesses, uh, capital access uh, for their businesses, for workforce development, as well as for uh, their accounting. Uh, we also offer, offer free working spaces for our ventures. Uh, some of our ventures are pre revenue. So, what we do is we provide them with uh, those office spaces where they can meet with clients and meet with their uh, members as it relates to their business needs as well. The average programmatic uh, impact scores remain high throughout the program. What we try to do is we try to survey these ventures throughout the program just to let them know that we're meeting where they are and try to cater to their needs through these through these surveys so that we know exactly what type of uh, foundational curriculums that we need for to provide to them as well. And we're driven by results. Ventures uh, generated over just 600,000 came earned revenue and uh, 75,000 in ph philanthropy give, given. Uh, the ventures reported an aggregate profit margins of 250K throughout the program. And the 2021 cohort rated Propeller highly with net promoter score at 93.7. Uh, and we provide them with the resources they need uh, to have sustainable businesses. And Damien, if I could also interject that we are also partnering together with Fund 17 yep. uh, with financial literacy for our small businesses. If we don't have financial literacy, no matter how good we are in the work that we do, we can, we'll never be successful. So financial literacy uh, is one of, the, one, of, one of the things we're doing through the Vance and Cities and J.P. Morgan Chase. And this is just a picture of our 2022 cohort. As you can see, a lot of different businesses uh, throughout our program, both on the nonprofit side and a profit side. Yeah, and we have an invitation to all city council members to come to our November 3rd um, end of program celebration. So we'll send invites for that uh, for that date. And we've also done some a lot of work in the Hoffman Triangle Neighborhood Association in that neighborhood with churches, with homeowners. If you go by Jerusalem Church there, you'll see the per permanent pavers there. You go by um, Stronger hope, and you'll see that. But also, that we're looking at home homeowners also in conjunction with the Urban Conservancy and Umbrella. We have been able to look at a target space and look how we're looking at how we're making an impact as it relates to how many gallons of water we're storing, how we're mitigating um, stormwater flooding in that particular neighborhood. Good morning again. Um, we're currently working on measures at the state and local levels, particularly in the green infrastructure and water sector, as, has been, as we have discussed earlier this morning. All of our advocacy work is centered around equitable and inclusive procurement. We know it's in the cities, the states, as well as our anchor institution's best interests to develop equitable, poli equitable policies and practices. 
We have been diligently working, some may confuse our efforts with pestering, but working nonetheless with decision makers on developing policies that promote equity. Uh, we are advocating for change to procurement policies that we know have systemically excluded black and brown businesses from full participation in accessing opportunity. So steps like adopting equitable procurement policies will be good for our institutions. It will be good for the city of New Orleans and our community overall. Some examples of our advocacy work include right here in the city. Some of the things that have been mentioned this morning We've been working in concert with project managers, the Office of Economic Development, Office of Supply Diversity, Resiliency, DPW, Sewage and Water Board. We have recognized that it takes all of our efforts, all of these um, organizations and agencies, um, departments working in concert to actually make impact and make a change. We've identified specific projects that can be further debundled but looking deeper into procurement processes that may lead to better, more inclusive participation by minority businesses. We have developed a public um, RFP tracker with over $210 million worth of new green infrastructure projects spanning through to 2024. And, and in order to help BIPOC businesses and entrepreneurs prepare for those future opportunities. We've worked with the city in various equity initiatives such as Advancing Cities and the National League of Cities, Cities Inclusive Entrepreneurship Initiative. Next, there's the NORCAP program that you've heard a lot about this morning. Um, Thrive NOLA particularly has been very innovative in this approach with working with this program and opening it up to small and very, very small contractors that would otherwise likely not enjoy a contract with the city or any public entity for that matter. Specifically, our goal with NOR is to engage 10 emerging BIPOC-owned small businesses in green infrastructure. For example, if a small BIPOC landscaper, a Black-owned landscaper, pivoting into green infrastructure gets four projects with an approximate value of $25,000 per job. That's a res that would, would result in a $100,000 contract for that very small business. Dare I say this could be a game changer for that business. And with additional funding, we can and will do um, work with more additional small businesses. At the state level, we've been working with CPRA. As you've heard, we've had a, a, a pretty good track record with working with state agencies, particularly with CPRA. Most recently, Propeller is a part of an amazing work group um, with um, the Louisiana Chamber of Foundation, the Foundation for Louisiana, and many other organizations. We collectively sent a demand letter to CPRA um, the govern and the governor um, as well, requesting more equitable contracting uh, practices with CPRA. You heard the billions of dollars and the opportunity that Andrea mentioned before. So this is a really key time for us to send that letter right now. As a result of that collective advocacy work, Chairman Clips, Chip Klein and CPRA um, Executive Director Brent Haas have agreed to amending contract language to require submission of some subcontractor invoices. They have agreed to establish monthly BIPOC contractor meetings with CPRA leadership, as well as um, individual in in introductions between top 10 to 20 um, CPRA contractors and decision makers with our group. It cannot be overstated how Congressman Troy Carter's office has been extremely instrumental in moving the, the, um, the dial here and helping us advocate with this agency. Propeller has created an external um, template of uh, uh, equitable procurement um, template, uh, policy template, for, um, if you will, that we've been sharing with different partners who are interested in this, in this work and in moving into it um, and changing their policies to be more equitable. 
we are working with um, nonprofits, hospitals, and universities, other um, economic development organizations around this policy. We have developed partnerships with the New Orleans Regional Black Chamber, the Villa Vassal Group, to ensure a strong pipeline of Black-owned businesses will be ready to go after these procurement opportunities. We have most recently started working um, on with Hope Enterprise Corporation on a supplier diversity guide. So as you can see, our equitable procurement um, advocacy work continues, but because we know that uh, procurement is key to closing the racial wealth gap. One thing also I want to just, just to add to that, and thank you, uh, Adele, for that and, and our advocacy work, but I want to publicly first just thank Andrea and her team. It's great to be your partner. Uh, Sune, she's here today. Thank you so much for what you, all of you've done to help us out. But Jeff Swartz also for economic yes. development. Uh, Devon from DDD, I saw him in here earlier. He's been an advocate. And Norman Bar Barnum also from NOLA Business Alliance. There's so many people, Cedric Patan, so many people out that are helping us get this work done. And but we can't do it without you. And we'll be coming back to you looking and seeking your help. And for because we want our people to be part of their own solution. And that's what we're trying to do here. Um, and the whole city will be enhanced if everyone can be part of this, this movement. Oh, oh, oh Nora Cap, okay. So it's my time to talk. We, we talked about Nora Cap. Most of you know what the Jilly Cap program is. You guys have expanded it, but $25,000 for each house to be retrofitted um, for green infrastructure, biosphones, rain gardens, permal pavers, that sort of thing. So we've done 75 houses already. We've helped probably 15 businesses um, get contracts doing that. We've helped many people from the workforce link to that, but that's just a way for, for individuals, for companies, and for um, the workforce to come together and get these small bite-sized contracts as we help them build that acumen, help them with the back of the office stuff, help them defray some of the costs. I'll say this, and I don't know if it's PC for me to say it, but I'll say it, um, is that we sometimes we, we expect companies to get on I-10 and go to Houston at 100 miles an hour. But before they can get on I-10, they need an on-ramp. So for us, we're preparing them to get onto the on-ramp. I remember I once tried to get on the, in a CrossFit, and they had, had to get on the on-ramp. And I said to myself, if the, if the highway is like the on-ramp, I never want to get on. So I want businesses to know that we're here to help them uh, with the on-ramp so they can get on the highway and they can compete with anybody once we put our arms around them to help them grow and be sustainable. And we really see the Nora Cap program as a um, as a model for other um, city departments because the contracts are debundled to a size where very small contractors can participate. Between the twenty five thousand to one hundred and fifty thousand dollar level, many many contractors can participate. But if you're letting contracts out at two to three million, you're effectively cutting out a whole swath of the city. So we really commend Nora for establishing this program and putting in the energy. And that really the time to to put it together because it does take a little bit more time to do it. So and for your foresight also into seeing the the the, the rationale for expansion of the, the CAP program. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that concludes our presentation. Um, thank you all. Well, thank you all so much for all of the work that you do and the tremendous help that you offer to uh, new businesses mm -hmm. uh, and for the uh, for being that on ramp, as you mentioned, I was going to say for being that that handholder, but yeah. you know, you mentioned it perfectly. Uh, that's the best way to describe it for being yeah. that on ramp. So thank you. Uh, really, the only uh, it's not really a question; it's more of a comment. But um, I really do want to learn more as to how the city council can assist on um, the contracting piece, dealing with the state on what you would need from us. Um, you know, whether you want to get with us later, have a separate meeting, get with our chiefs, but but I, I'm very interested in figuring out that piece. The other thing too, that I think would be helpful, and you you may already be doing this, is to get uh, with the group, the collaborative that is working on, and Stephen Kennedy's here with the collaborative, but they are working on a variety of different things, dealing with fair and equitable uh, contracting uh, here on the local level and on the state level. So that, that may be a, a good uh, partnership. Well. Yes. Yes. yes, thank okay. you. Um, so 
in response, what can city council do in terms of the state contracting piece? I know that the connection maybe isn't direct, but I believe that advocacy mm -hmm. um, at the state level very, very much helps. It's helped already. The more pressure that we can be sending from our side to the state, specifically to a few different agencies, one of which is the Army Corps, which they have one right. of their, you know, one of their sites is in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot that we can do to make entree into these agencies to look into their opportunities for transparency even right. many of these agencies we cannot tell what they're sub what they're sub uh, with the primes mm -hmm. who they are subcontracting with what for what amount and we cannot take action if we do not know you all mentioned data previously if we don't have the data we can't take the next step or not in a very informed way. So we believe that is the first step. The second piece of, piece of it is many of these prime contractors that work at the state level are, they have um, uh, their Louisiana, um, I guess, sites are in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so how can we make entree into some of these New Orleans located prime contractors who also do work with the city of New Orleans around really um, subcontracting with folks here um, workforce and hiring mm -hmm. local workforce here in New Orleans. Yes, and also always leveraging and your relationships with our state representatives to help push sure. this effort mm -hmm. is always welcomed. Okay, uh, Councilmember Harris, then Green. Well, I have to speak because I have to give a shout out to District B represented <laughs> right here. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming. Um, excited to work with y'all. Um, do you, or how can we help promote um, your services to, for example, private homeowners who might want to invest in their own green infrastructure? How do we make those connections? Well, I think the way we do it is in the communities like we did in Hoff and Triangle. We, we, can, we can host public meetings. Um, we can come in, into the community and, and, and do tours of the community. But it's also just leveraging with community leaders like the Neighborhood Association, like the churches, to help people see that this is a great opportunity. Um, we would love to even do more tours of the work that we've done in Hoffman Triangle also, uh, but it's just outreach and we have a, a really good outreach machine, I would say. So if there are other neighborhoods like the other than the Hoffman Broadmoor, whatever that looks like, we can do seminars, we can bring in the best and brightest. And Bernadette hasn't said anything yet, but um, she's a, she has a master's degree in landscape architect from LSU. We have another young lady on our program with that same degree. So we'll take the show on the road, um, Leslie or Councilmember Harris, just to make sure that we can let people know the importance of in, of, of how to um, get their homes retrofitted for, for green infrastructure and some water management. So I think one thing that I can help with in particular is we have a series of town halls quarterly, yes. and I'd love to invite y'all to come present at the next one. I don't know the date yet. I was but, at your last one. I'll yeah, so I, maybe come and present and speak about it. And then, of course, we can also assist in coming to speak to the various neighborhood organizations. What I will say about District B is that not every neighborhood, as you know, is represented by a neighborhood association. So, for example, Central City does not have a right. single. Um, so they're getting really out into the community, if we can brainstorm about stormwater management and, and really um, getting neighbors and neighborhoods to understand what that means and how it can work and how it can save money is important. I would speak on behalf of the family and me and Andrea are together. We're willing to go out and, and okay. go out there and help. I know Matt is awesome on your team yeah. and we just did a walking tour not long ago. So um, we're willing to go to the streets. We'll take it to the streets. Perfect. I can't wait to do it with you. Yeah. See you. We're going to also do the same thing in the ninth ward. <laughs> well, no, that's my question. <laughs> no, but um, thank you very much for um, what you do, Propeller Thrive NOLA, and for um, the strong supporters. Um, what you do does make a difference. I have a chance to talk to some business owners out there and entrepreneurs. And um, yes, I do go to a lot of activities. I appreciate the graduation ceremony. Yes, yes. To yes, see yes, those yes. young folks out there, the water challenge um, was good. And I'd like more citizens to know um, more about what is going on. So in whatever way that I can help, not only our newsletter, but attending meetings and sharing information, I will. Um, I do want to talk about the um, green infrastructure opportunities. Obviously, a lot of money. We have a very supportive federal administration in that respect. Um, we have a kind of a supportive state, not as supportive as they could be in some respects. So sure. I appreciate the um, opportunities that you all are going to help present for people to work in the green infrastructure industry, which is going to be a long term project, a long term project of opportunities. I would like to know how we can work together 
on identifying, not only in my district, but in my district, there are a lot of vacant lots, including uh -huh. across the street from Newburgh. Yes. Um, I don't have it formulated as to how I want to do it, but I want to tell each of you all your ideas are going to be appreciated. That is a green infrastructure opportunity. All these vacant lots in the Ninth Ward, in a Desire, Florida area. Somehow or the other, we've got to get those lots into the hands of people who can maintain them right. and maybe grow on them, but also use them to mitigate flooding. And there's still a lot of money for that out there. For example, across from New Birth, what is it, four or five lots that yes. they refuse to maintain? Right, one is right next door to our church. Right next door to your church. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, Chuck, as you think about it, and the city council will help, I'd like to go with the assistance of folks who have experience on the state level. And I'd like to look at somehow changing the laws so that if after a while it's been proven that there's not going to be development taking place there, that the city or a nonprofit organization, a nonprofit organization that works with an individual may be able to take those lots back and put them into some form of commerce. As I mentioned, it could be gardens, sure. which was more important along Johnny Jackson Jr. Boulevard sure. than having vacant lots. They could be productive bioswales. They could be productive um, areas where farming, urban farming takes oh, place, very much so. but there's a lot of opportunity and potential money sure. during this time period right. for that. So. Please um, let all of us know how we can help. We'll certainly advocate for it, but I do want you to think about this, Chuck and um, Council Member Moreno and Harris, um, because we've been focusing a lot on light reduction and thank you for the what was done today in terms of the ordinance that we're gonna be bringing before, right. before our council meeting. Council Member Harris at her public, um, at the Quality of Life Committee yes. brought up that issue of blight. But there are some things that we can do to address blight that creates opportunities for people out there. And I'd I would, love to employ a couple of people to be responsible for right. maintenance of yes. a few lots. See, we have you know. the people, man. Right. You've been over, you saw the graduation. Right. Our business academy is right there on Desire, you know, 3600 Desire Parkway. We have 20, 25 guys there, uh, women and guys, all the time. Mm -hmm. We would love to have a contract with maybe 10 of them. And what, help, what that does, it helps to fray our earn and learn apprenticeship dollars that we're paying from our general fund as an organization and do that work. And then they can build their work act, build their work history, build their resumes, but also turn those spaces into green havens. Right. And that would be a wonderful thing to do. And we may have to look at something that is almost like the level that people don't want to go to. But if you haven't done the successions after decades, uh -huh. If you haven't maintained the lot because nobody's interested in it, those lots on Johnny Jackson Boulevard, those lots on um, other thoroughfares may need to be turned over to an organization that has the commitment yes. to get something done to make them more productive. Yeah. So um, I'm going to have more discussion about how to do that. But during this next, because it's really a state issue. I mean, uh -huh. it's more, than, more so than local. It's a state issue. But we need to address the reality that some of those lots are an incredible detriment to the community mm -hmm. and um, what, how beautiful they could be, how much they can enhance, especially areas that have been neglected if we put them into the hands right. of entities that were in, Which impacts in crime and other determinants yeah. in, in our community. Young kids who walk past your beautiful church on one side and see five vacant lots that are growing off into the sidewalk and the yeah. street on the other, on their way to Carver, yeah. don't feel that great right. about supporting the community. Right. And um, But if they saw something different, if they saw bioswales, if they saw food being grown there, yeah. if they saw fences around right. it with young guys who go through your programs, maintaining them in a way that was beautiful, yeah. um, I think that that would make a difference. I want to work with you all on that. And that's one thing that the council can do is advocate at the next okay. legislative session for some changes in laws that make it available, make those opportunities available in addition to lobbying for additional money. Right. Yes. You know? And our understanding, too, is that some of those maintenance contracts, DPW's team is currently trying to rethink how they are done. And so maybe a next step is we could meet with um, uh, Mary Kincaid, that's our contact over at the DPW office, um, around the maintenance contracts and some of these upcoming projects 
and we hear that there are state ARPA dollars that the city has to apply for in order to get. And so maybe that's a conversation that we could have with, um, you know, with your offices um, and meet with DPW to figure out like what is the timeline for the re-release of some of these maintenance contracts. When is the next opportunity for our city to apply for some of these state level dollars? Um, for um, blight reduction and for green infrastructure, because that was the um, resilience. The, I think that was the header in which it had to fit. So, mm -hmm. okay, I look forward to working with you all, and I know our council members are going to be as enthusiastic about it. Just think, Chuck, if you drove Johnny Jackson Jr. and turned on to humanity, and every once in a while you saw lots that were very well maintained yes. with signs on them saying that the city and Thrive Nola and Propeller are motivating entrepreneurs sure. to get involved with those projects. Sure. It's win-win for everybody involved. Let's make that happen. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Thank you. You'll be any public comment? Okay. Do you have any online while she fills it out? Go ahead and read it. This online comment comes from Val Cupid for informational purposes only. I bought the lot next to my home for green space. No structures, eight feet below sea level planted plants and trees. It will never catch on fire, need EMS, nor in need of police response. The assessor, Errol Williams, is bent on, I pay the same land tax that he has for the land under my house for my assessment at $25 per square foot per year. I made my case to the Board of Review and Louisiana Tax Commission. I have succeeded successfully with those agencies. Now the assessor is suing me in court and LA Tax Commission wasting taxpayer money on this legal defense. Point is, an empty lot is helping the neighborhood as a retention pond on rainy days, keeps water out of the sewer drains, and helps the environment. We would like, to, I would like support and efforts to those that keep it green for all the right purposes and tell assessor to stop being with his anti-environment agenda. I don't want a free pass on tax, I'll willingly pay $20 per square foot. Those that live on and back up to Bayou, Bayou St. John slash Bancroft Drive pay $18 and pour $14 per square foot on this street as a comparison. Help those New Orleanians by advocating for those that help in the neighborhoods by giving property tax breaks to those that are trying to keep it green. Val Cupid, Lakeview. Thanks, you'll be. Uh, Ms. Peixo, come on up. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning. I'm Rosalind Pacho, and I'm here uh, as just as a little resident who uh, lives in Hoffman, who uh, lives in Kalamata, who's the uh, original founder of, of Hoffman Triangle. I made it up one day a long time ago. Uh, but thank you all so much for what you guys are doing in terms of trying to green the area. It's so very, very important. Other ways I'm thinking in terms of getting the information out, though, is like ne neighbors next door, you know, the city planning has a list of all the neighborhood associations. Send the information out to all the neighborhood associations so that they will be aware of what it is that's available for them to be able to do things within their neighborhoods. And that way it's gonna be a bigger help to what it is that you're trying to do. So Clamat is down. I y'all talked about the state a little bit and I'm not gonna mention that right now. Uh, <laughs> but whatever it is that we can do to facilitate greening New Orleans and helping us not drown we want to do in safety and permits. I'd like to make a suggestion in case it's not already there. When they, people come and apply for those permits, make sure they're not putting down concrete. Make sure they're doing permeable driveways so that they are not adding on to a problem that we already have. Thanks. Thanks, Ms. Pacho. All right. Well, I see no more comments. Thank you all so much for your work and your presentation. Appreciate you. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. All right, Eugene. Good to see you. It's that time. <laughs> <laughs> I proudly move for adjournment. All right. Executive by Council Member Harris. All in favor, aye. All right. Aye. Don't leave.